What's the worst financial situation that's happened to you? I, oh geez. Um, there were two. One I would say, which was a dumb move, dumb. Let's welcome to the channel, Graham Stefan, finance extraordinaire, money wizard. He helps us learn everything we need to know about finances. But in this podcast, we talk about his cancer scare, about the worst financial decision that he ever made and him fighting on Creator Clash. This is a really exciting conversation. I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I did. Let's get started with the checkup with Graham Stefan. We just started talking about it, but now I really want to dive into okay, it. Okay, let's do it. How long have you been doing YouTube? It'll be over six years. I started December of 2016, wow. which feels like forever ago, but it's not that long when you really think about it. We're like four months apart in Are our you YouTube serious? birthdays. Yeah, we started in April 2017. No way. So almost the exact same timeline as you. You started after me? Yeah. What? Yeah. No. Yeah. In, in, in April 2017, it was the tail end of my residency. Wow. And Dan and I met and we said, you know what? Let's do YouTube and we're going to crush this. And we did far from it. <laughs> you did a fantastic year. job. The uh, Dr. Reacts videos were yes. how I found you initially. I well, that's how it, the channel blew up. Yeah. Actually, you probably haven't heard this, but we got fired by our MCN, which is a multi-channel network yeah. that I remember this creators. back in the yes. day. So we got hired by one initially. They were giving us some funding. And then they fired us after a year and said, your channel's not successful. And we got really upset. And we said, we're going to prove them wrong. One month later, Dr. Reacts goes viral. We get a million subscribers oh overnight. Oh my gosh. And now they're out of business. It was a fantastic concept. <laughs> it was a great yeah. concept. I mean, the whole idea of React was already out there. Yeah. And the whole purpose of doing the YouTube channel was doing things that were already successful and making them medical. Isn't that how you started with your content as well? Yes. Uh, and by the way, my second channel, The Graham Stephan Show, mm -hmm. was... Uh, partly inspired by you and Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey had the okay. Dave Ramsey show. I had the Graham Stephan show. But the Millionaire Reacts series, which is what I started with, was inspired by your Dr. Reacts. <laughs> okay. So I got Dr. Reacts, Millionaire Reacts. And those first few videos I did on the channel, a lot of them got anywhere from like 200,000 to a million views on like a brand new channel from Millionaire Reacts when it was like brand new. So I owe that partly to you. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's exciting. Did you, like, how did you make the decision to split up the channels from doing... Uh, like your single channel and then creating new avenues of different channels. Yeah. Because I'm always torn on that. Yeah. Everything is algorithm oriented. So mm -hmm. when I saw on the main channel, there was a format that fit and worked. Mm -hmm. And I know at least for myself, when people throw everything at one channel, they tend to not watch the videos because they might only be interested in one out of every four things that gets posted and then they watch nothing. So my thought was that I'm going to do separate content on other channels. And if people are interested in that, they'll subscribe both places. But I don't want people to see something that they're not subscribed to. Got it. And if I'm a person that lives on the moon and I haven't seen your content, what is your content about? It's all personal finance based. So anything in terms of uh, my thoughts on investing, saving money, uh, building wealth, real estate. It was started from anything that I wanted to see myself on YouTube. I just made videos about it okay. uh, back when uh, you know I was in my 20s, uh, mid 20s didn't have a lot of friends who were interested in like personal finance. Okay. And so I would just- Most 20 year olds are not. I would be on Reddit in all of these like financial independence, personal finance subreddits mm -hmm. and just talking to people about personal finance. But I thought, oh man, it'd be, and I loved watching YouTube. So I just thought, how cool would this be if I could talk to other people about personal finance? And there's no other videos on YouTube that were talking about these mm -hmm. things. So I thought I could do that. And were you I, seeing the same mistakes repeated by your friends and peers? Yeah, oh gosh, I had a buddy. <laughs> And uh, I won't name him, but uh, he got a $200 bonus for Thanksgiving okay. and blew it and more at the bar the same night he got the bonus. Well, that's what the purpose of getting a bonus. And I was no? like, dude, what are you doing? You could just like invest to do a Roth IRA. He's like, no, man, you I got my whole- You wanted him to invest his 200 bucks in a, in Roth, a Roth IRA. IRA. Yeah. And wow. his, but his mindset was, you know what? I got my whole life ahead of me. I'm just going to have fun. I could do that when I'm 30, but I'm like, dude, the compound interest, if you just invested right now, <laughs> get that, that extra five years uh, could be substantial, but you blew it at the bar. But here's the thing, though. I noticed with his budget is that when he had the $200, he'd be buying everyone drinks and doing this and that. When he was like nothing, he would find a way to make the nothing work as well mm. in terms of like, you know, just buying cheaper stuff or doing this or do it. Like, you'll find a way to budget. So okay. he just made use of whatever money he had. Um, but I just thought, man, if, if someone could just say like, Hey, instead of spending $200 at the bar, let's uh, meet up at your place beforehand. We'll take an Uber down there and we'll spend a fraction of the cost. 
Got it. So it wasn't that he was spending his money. It was the way he was spending it that bothered you. So it bothered me. <laughs> Someone else spends their money. Yeah, <laughs> it did. It's just the principle of it. Sure. I don't know. It's it's just the idea of wasting money. How do you differentiate <laughs> between wasting money and spending money? Oh, uh, that's a great question. I think a lot of it's relative for me personally. And, I, you know, I, I rail on people for, I think, spending too much. But for me, it's it's what gets the biggest bang for the buck. And so if you could get 90% of the experience for 10% of the cost, I'd be like, that's a great deal versus chasing that little extra bit. Um, mm -hmm. So I've always viewed things as like what gets the best bang for the buck and, and optimizing that. And do you feel like in general, 20 year olds don't think about it that way? Just starting to. Okay. I've noticed now it's starting to become trendy. To really? Like, yeah, to like start saving money. But maybe I'm I'm in a weird group where it's like okay. they're all like kind of personal finance enthusiasts. Yeah. I've I bet if I went to a college campus, maybe it would be different. Mm -hmm. But I'm finding it to be more mainstream now. And ten years ago it did not used to be the case. Interesting. And where where do you think that cultural shift is happening from? Because of I would like to think it's YouTube. I really? would I would like to think that it's become I think Shark Tank had had a big pull mm -hmm. on people to uh, think about business mm -hmm. and becoming an entrepreneur, doing their own thing. I think the internet, social media has really opened people up to communicating with, with others who are like-minded around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would like to think that YouTube had a big push and just content that's out there that people just stumble upon usually. It's like, oh, I didn't know I should do that and open a 401k and all the benefits of that and just like trying to make it cool, I think is really important. But you did that before YouTube, before Shark Tank. So what got you into it? Uh, well, I mean, I used to watch Shark Tank as a kid. I mean, okay. I was 17, 18 years old. I think that show came out in 2008. And then before that, it was Dragon's Den in Canada. Okay. And I watched you it there You were watching too. it there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Because I have a lot of family in Canada. But you had interest in the business world already at that age as a teenager. Yeah. I was always just Where like, does that come from? I don't know. I just always naturally like inclined to save money. Like, you know, as oh. a kid, you okay. get like, you know, birthday money or like, you know, Christmas or grandma would like send you 20 bucks or something like that. I'd put it in an envelope. I just like, I'd... I'd Got more enjoyment for saving it than I would spend it. Like I didn't want to spend it. I just wanted to save it. Uh, but then as I got older, I realized like how tough it is to make money sometimes. There was, uh, you know, throughout high school, I had a part-time job and that, you know, did well for what I was doing at like 14, 15. I'd be able to make like $100 in like a weekend or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but there was a moment there, like right as I was graduating high school, I worked at a uh, uh, gold investment firm in okay. Santa Monica and I got minimum wage doing data entry. And this is like a weird point. Like my my high school kind of ended around February, but we didn't technically graduate until like April. So I had this weird stint there where I was like waiting here back from colleges and I wanted to work. And I got a job like, I think it was $7.75 an hour, like eight bucks an hour, like that. And I remember looking at the first check after like two weeks, or it was a week and a half. And after taxes being taken out, how little it was. And that just reset my gauge for like, if I buy a Starbucks, that's an hour of my time. Do I really want to spend an hour working extra to pay for the Starbucks? Same thing with going out to lunch. The lunch could be like $15. It's like, do I want to work two and a half hours to pay for the lunch? Like that just makes my day two and a half hours longer just to break even on that. Mm -hmm. So I just found ways to optimize. But that set my thinking at like how far a dollar could go. Is that because of the financial circumstances you grew up around or not at all? There were there were times where my parents were certainly paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. um, I distinctly remember seeing my dad struggle with paying rent sometimes. And uh, I think that went into it. That was probably when I was like 15, you know, 16, give or take 14. Um, I was already more of like a natural saver before then. But I think maybe that reinforced like, you got to save for a rainy day. You should always have something to fall back on. Anything could happen, even if it's outside your control. You could do everything perfect and you'll always be throwing a curveball. So sure. it's like preparing for that in advance. And I find it hard uh, to ultimately make the decision with each circumstance when, whether or not something is valuable. Because value is such a weird proposition when it comes to experience. For someone, going to the bar might be a complete valueless experience where they're just drinking and spending all their hard earned bonus money. But then for someone else, it could mean finding their future spouse. That's true. So how do you balance that between, okay, I'm going to go all out and have fun and enjoy my time as a young person versus I got to be responsible and safe. Do you ever have those two angel demon uh, no. situations? I, I was extremely disciplined throughout my twenties. Okay. I 
for me, it was it was saving was was the bottom line. Mm-hmm. But I enjoyed saving, so I was I, like I got enjoyment and pleasure from like not doing that. It was almost like a game for me mm-hmm. to be like, how could I make ten dollars last? You know, there's two days, and what groceries can I find? Like for me, you it was were fun. making YouTube videos yeah. before that was like a concept, right? But but my thinking was that if if you hunker down for your twenties mm-hmm. and like live below your means, do everything you can, work nonstop, and just just say that you're going to sacrifice a decade in your twenties, you could really set yourself up for the rest of your life, depending on how much you make and how much you're able to save and where you live. Obviously, there's so mm-hmm. many variables to that. But I think for a lot of people, if you just, I'm not saying never have fun, but I'm saying sacrifice 10 years in your 20s from 20 to 30 live like you're broke live like a college student with a whole bunch of roommates work your ass off get two jobs if you had do anything you can and by the time you're 30 i think what you've set up there will compound for the rest of your life and that's kind of how i've operated and only now am i starting to like take the foot off the gas a little bit and like enjoy the things but then i'm coming back to i'm like man i just enjoy working you know (laughs) there's nothing that i could really buy that like i i have have more fun sitting down and planning out a video or going on a podcast than anything else at this point sure because my question would be and maybe it's partially me playing devil's advocate yeah you're hunkering down in your 20s you're saving the money for those 10 years for, for what what is the end goal in the 30s okay you have money saved up and maybe you have more flexible spending that itself doesn't buy you joy if you hate the process of saving is it worth yeah. doing it? You know what it is for me? It's the options. I okay. like having options mm-hmm. of like, not that I would do it, but like hypothetically, <laughs> okay, I want to go to Florida tomorrow and fly first class if I wanted to. I could do that and that would be okay and that would be sustainable and mm-hmm. I wouldn't have to go broke doing it. And if I wanted to do that every day, I could find a way to make that work. I, I like having the options mm-hmm. and having that freedom. It's, it's just, it, it takes the stress off everything else. Just knowing that, Anything is possible. Have you ever sacrificed your health for the benefit of savings? I would say yes. I would say, well, no. For savings, we could put it this way. Uh, 2020 and 2021 did not go to the gym at all. Really? At all. And I would go to the gym really since I turned 18. I would go four to five times a week. Was that pandemic related or work related? Uh, Both initially it was pandemic related. The gym closed down. Sure. And so I used that time to work instead. And then throughout those next two years, it was there was so much going on and it was so crazy for my schedule that I thought, well, that hour it takes me at the gym, it's 15 minutes getting there, 50, that's an hour and a half. Well, uh, what's what's my time worth right now? Oh, that hour and a half, that's, a, that's an expensive hour and a half. Well, if I just make a video instead, or I put more time in mm. doing the podcast, that's a better use. And I justify that for two years wow. of just hunkering down on that. Now, you know, every now and then I'd go and lift weights, or do, but it wasn't like as my dedicated regimen like I had. Um, and that also went with like, when you stop going to the gym, you generally tend to eat a little bit more. You're a little hungrier for some reason. So I put on maybe 10 pounds. I mean, it's, it's like on my frame though, it's like 10, 15 pounds is like a decent amount. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe not 15, probably 10, but, uh, I definitely noticed I was sluggish. I uh, did not have as much energy. I couldn't think as clearly. I was more stressed out. And it was actually Creator Clash that got me back into it. And that was like one of the reasons, one of the many reasons I decided to do it. Really? But like kicked me into shape. That's what I need to know because that is ultimately the worst use of your time financially because it's for charity. Yeah. It's not something that is going to be good for your health, your wallet. The training costs money. There's a huge time component investment. Why in the world did you decide to get punched in the face? I thought it was too real. I thought, first of all, it's a good cause. Okay. And then I thought 20 years from now, would I look back at like 50 years old and regret not doing it? Would I ever look back and question mm. that decision? And the answer is yes. Like I would, if I didn't say yes, I would look back. And think, what if I had done that? I mm. never wanted to look back and think, what if? And so I said, yes. Wow. And is that how you view most decisions these days? Now it is. It didn't used to be. Yeah, I was going to say, because that doesn't fit the model that you described earlier. No. So why the shift now? Uh, I think it got to a point where uh, overall, I think uh, my values have changed slightly. I think my 20s, I've always just thought to myself, I'm like, really from 20 to 35, I was just going to head down work. Mm -hmm. Um, 
But now it's gotten to a point where I feel like I could start making those alternative decisions and think about like just future regret of things and trying to minimize that. It's like minimizing regret of the future. Um, and so now I, I kind of process everything I do through that lens of like, will I regret not doing it? And most of it turns out great. And I look back at that to think, oh, I'm glad I did that. Some of it every now and then, like, ah, oh, you know what? That wasn't worth it. But you win some, you lose some. Oh, well, on to the next one. Yeah. Did you have any regret from your 20s? Uh, there were a few things that I, I was definitely, I saved too much money. Like it it, it sounds weird to say, but like there were stupid things when I, uh, was like just starting out as a, as a real estate agent. Like I, I calculated the cost of gas to go and visit friends and like, I shouldn't have done that. Mm. I'm talking like, you know, this is like maybe the first week or two and I wasn't, I I was working for free and I'm like trying to budget my gas and I'm like, well, the friend lives over here. Gas prices were like all time highs. Mm -hmm. And I calculate, it's going to be like $6 in gas. And I'm like, well, that would have been an hour of me working at the previous place. Is it really worth it? I'm going to see him for an hour and a half and drive back. So it's like, it's not worth it. And I, I, I would literally cancel plans mm -hmm. or just not make them because it's like, well, the gas would cost more than I'm going to get to see you. It's, it's like so stupid. Looking back. Well, it's not stupid, just hyper practical. Yeah. yeah okay, sure. I'll go with that. <laughs> but looking back, that was dumb. Okay. And I shouldn't have been to that degree. Mm. Uh, there are also a few other like little things. Like there would be car meets mm. that I and I bought like my first commission. I bought a Lotus Elise. It was mm. thirty grand. I like spent the whole commission Beautiful. on the car and the, the tax and all that. Super light. Yeah, and I loved it. But I <laughs> so stupid. Spent thirty grand on the car, but I wouldn't go to some of the drives because I didn't want to spend the money on the gas. <laughs> it's stupid. You were like but, punishing yourself. But at the time, I was like, well. If I go to these ones, it's like the extra ones won't matter that much. I do mm. one a month instead of two. It's you like, were doing like fantasy football with your gas costs. Yeah, I, was, I really tried to maximize it. Mm. I mean, looking back, it was stupid. I didn't have to mm. do any of that sort of stuff. Um, but you know what? In the moment, it, it made sense. <laughs> I, sure. I, it worked. Um, I think the same could be said about going on vacations. I really didn't go on vacations just because I, I always wanted to be on call for clients. Like mm -hmm. I wanted to be a real estate agent where if someone calls me last minute, 24-7, I'll drop everything and I'll show the house. Mm -hmm. Rarely did it happen to that degree where it's like a Friday night, but I would do it and that's happened. So I've always just tried to be available. And now looking back, doing Creator Clash, you didn't get the win. Michael Reeves turned out to be a, a, a beast. A monster. In the ring. Yeah. Um, do you have regrets <laughs> of doing it, actually? No. The other way around. No. No, I don't. W tell, tell me about that. Uh, I would say my only regret with that is I should have trained more. Mm. That, that is my. Did you train, under train, you think? I believe so. Um, I should have prioritized it more and I didn't. And I was trying to balance the two. And I realized with Michael, he's, he's, he's the type where he's 110% or zero. Mm -hmm. There's no in between. Yeah. And I was like an 80%. Okay. I can't compete. Is it the uh, number of days per week that we're talking 80%? Is it the effort you put in the training sessions or just time in general? I think everything, even his mentality. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I was able to block off four times a week for an hour and a half mm -hmm. and just train. But he was able to knock off like seven, six days a week, wow. live it every day. And for me, I was trying to do that in conjunction with like not slowing down the momentum of, I was like trying to ramp up momentum in everything else mm -hmm. and do that on top of it. But also Michael was just insanely talented. Like the fact, like he, he maneuvered like in ways that I can't <laughs> do that. Like my back doesn't move in that direction. And he's like, just like, you know, going around like, I, I he's very slithery. In he the is. Like he, I'm surprised he's, so he's not on Crater Clash too. <laughs> you did you it. did you consider doing it again? No, never. No, that's it. You did it one and done. Yeah. Wow. So if Creator Clash Three calls and says this time it's for profit and we're giving you a million bucks, you're not doing it. Probably not. It would have to be. It would have to be at a point where it's all I'm doing. Mm. Okay. I'd say if I had nothing going on and I had a chance just to get like six months uninterrupted, where that's my only focus, I would do it. Mm. Interesting. What did uh, your loved ones, family members, say about you doing it? My mom thought I was joking. I <laughs> when you yeah, said it initially. Yeah, I didn't tell her. First of all, I didn't <gasps> tell her for a long time because I knew she'd get worried. Of course. And so I didn't tell her. And, mm -hmm. and I told her maybe like two weeks before. I'm like, oh, by the way, mom, I got like a boxing match. Don't ask me about it. It's like, she, and she thought, I was like, oh, okay. It's like, <laughs> no, I'm being real. She's like, no, you're not. And I'm like, I am, but just don't ask about it. Just, it is what it is. And I think it took her a week. She even brought it up uh, like a week later as like a joke. 
It's like, no, I was being serious there. <laughs> Did she so, come and watch no, in person? I told her not to watch. I told like all my family preferably do not watch. I didn't know how it was good. Like beforehand, sure. I don't know how I'm going to do. And so if, if I win, great. I can tell you about it afterwards. If something happens, I lose or I get hurt, I'll hear about it afterwards. So there's no yeah. point. You so don't want I kept them to it be under concerned. It. Yeah, it would make me more concerned. Like I was so nervous leading up to it that two weeks prior, I just got so irritable if anyone brought it up to me because I was panicking on these. Like I started you losing sleep. You looked nervous when we were there. <laughs> I, yeah. I have to say that. I started losing sleep. I started having like mini panic attacks. Mm. I had nightmares, recurring nightmares about like going up on the stage and like passing out mm. or just like having a panic attack and not being able to do it. And like mm -hmm. 10,000 people are watching. And the best way for me to cope with that was just not think about it. Mm -hmm. And so anytime someone brings it up, I just, I'd go into that state of panic. Sure. I can't, I can't be around it. Do, so. do you think maybe working with a sports psychologist would have given you more success in that situation? Potentially. Because a lot of success in the ring, I'm sure you've heard, is mental. And your approach two weeks before, your rest, your heart rate, all of that comes from your mental health. So I'm curious... If you were to do it again, would you consider doing that? Oh, a hundred percent. I didn't even know that was a thing. I'll tell you, like, well, I didn't even know. Yeah, so, th yeah. that's really big. Uh, the reason I mention is because I've also considered it for myself on my last match. Um, I experienced something similar to you mm -hmm. in that I feel like I dissociated from my emotions leading up to my match, meaning that I was so nervous that I got into this, I'm just going to push through mentality, kind of my Russian side, uh, USSR mentality. Yeah. And when you do that, you almost turn off all emotions. And when you turn off all emotions, that means you simultaneously turn off nerves, fear, but also joy, happiness, excitement, mm. which are things you need when you're going into a ring. You want to feel your heart rate go up. That anxiety that you're feeling is actually your body and mind prepping yourself for thinking quickly inside the ring. Mm. So I shut all of that down. And that's not good <laughs> when you're going to fight a pro fighter. Well, you know so. what you learn. And yep. so are you going to continue? Um, I'm not ruling it out. Okay. You just have to find the right person. Okay. Because I find myself in a weird scenario where I fought a YouTuber. Yeah. And now someone with a lot of fight experience, where do you go from there? Jake Paul. <laughs> well, that's a little bit too high of a job. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's tough. Time will tell, basically, okay. in that scenario. That's interesting. Um, for something I wanted to touch on was how you so carefully and practically planned out your 20s to get you to your 30s. Do you have any feelings of decreased happiness now that you are at the point where you wanted to be in your 20s, if that makes sense? None. I think now I'm at a point where I got to try to figure out what's next mm -hmm. and what's beyond it. Because when you have like these goals in your 20s, I feel like once you once you hit them, it's like, what's the next goal? And it's not it's not a money goal. It's like, wh where do I find the biggest happiness? Where, where do I get the most personal fulfillment? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find what that is and, and what leads me to continue learning. Uh, sometimes I feel like I've, I've tapped out in terms of what I'm what I can accomplish in one area. And I want to continue that and, and figure out what's next. I just don't want to be stagnant. Uh, so now it's a bit of a, I, I'd say this is some exploring years where I could really figure out like where I'm the happiest, what I want to be doing and what's like, what's, what's bigger than just me. Okay. And what is that? I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. Okay. Like, even How are me, you trying? I'm traveling. Uh, this is like, I, I never would have come to New York in the past. Like the, two years ago, me would be like, no, I'm just, I, I got to stay at home. I got to be in my office. If I, if I don't do like this thing that, I was so regimented by that. Like even taking an hour break, I would just feel antsy because I'd be like, I got to do this. Mm -hmm. um, now it's gotten to a point where like I, I find more enjoyment doing these trips and like wow. trying it. So this is a bit of an experiment of like, hey, taking five days. Uh, now we're still working like nonstop. Going sure. like, but it's it's a different sort of thing with with podcasts and traveling and getting to see new, new places and people. And mm -hmm. it's all these different experiences that I did put off in my 20s. Do you have like a baseline level of anxiety in general? Would you consider yourself? Uh, I don't think so. I, I think I'm pretty practical. I'm, I'm, I would say I'm prone to overthinking things. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably the worst of it is just any scenario, I'll, I'll play it out like from best to worst. And, okay. and I'll prepare myself, be like, if, if this goes bad, this is the worst case scenario. And it could be anything mm -hmm. to like the best case. And I'll do that with anything. And does that ever 
get you to a place where you're so worried about the negative outcome, the worst outcome, or not at all? You, you find yourself not really. Uh, there's a great book called The Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Okay. And the that's subtle art. And yeah. yeah, the subtle art. Yeah, that's it. Um, and it's just accepting the worst. Uh-huh. And if you could be okay with the worst, you're fine. And so I'll play out scenarios and it's the worst case scenario. Um, like, you know, if I'm buying a property, okay, what's the worst case scenario? Like, really, what's the worst case? Okay, well, you buy it and uh, there's a massive earthquake in Los Angeles. Okay, well, get insurance for that. Or you buy it and the real estate market goes down 50%. Okay, what about rents? Oh, yeah. And, and so I run through every scenario uh, on that. And I just accept, okay, well, that's the worst. And can I live with that? Yes, then I'll move forward. What's the worst financial situation that's happened to you? I, oh, geez. Um, there were two. One, I would say, which was a dumb move, dumb. I put, I think, 250 grand into Robinhood stock when it dropped. It went from like 90 bucks to 30 something or like 28. Mm-hmm. Isn't I, it like at seven now or something? It was nine, 950. <laughs> <laughs> that was, it was stupid. But, in, and by the in, way, I'm in, laughing. I did the same thing. Yeah. So, we're in, on the same in my defense, before people call me irresponsible, 90% of my money is in index funds. Mm-hmm. This was like, you know, a small portion of my portion, a small portion. I put it in Robin Hood. It was dumb. I shouldn't have done that. Um, and Wh- why did you do it? Do you have such strong belief in? I looked at I looked at Robin Hood. I thought objectively they had a strong cash balance. Everyone on Wall Street bets post Robin Hood screenshots. People hate Robin Hood, but they're still using it. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, they're not going away anytime soon. Um, I think I thought this would be a safe long term hold. Time will tell. But I have sold off of it uh, and used that to harvest losses against gains that I've made. So mm-hmm. you know. It is what it is, but Fair. you know, and what lesson, was the second? lesson learned. It was a business that I started up. I don't want to go into too much detail okay. about it, but okay. uh, it lost 230 grand. Wow. But I tried it out. Didn't work, not for me. Moved on from it. Okay. Well, we all have misses because yeah. in order to make a shot, you have to yeah. miss. But you know what? My misses, I would say, came from when I, when I deviated from the core of like what I really wanted to do. A lot of these things were like- Experimentation. Yeah. And a lot of it is when we're, when we're on the podcast, I get a lot of suggestions. And sometimes it's hard for me to, to go with my gut when people who are way more successful than me say, Graham, you should be doing this and you should be doing this. If I were in your position, I would do this and uh, do that. And I listen to it. I'm like, yeah, you know what? They're way more successful than I. Like, I, I should listen to these people. And at the root of it, the more I've listened and the more I've done that, that uh, you know, maybe that I wouldn't have done on my own it doesn't turn out well. Mm. And so a lot of that comes to do with like, you know, outsourcing, hiring, uh, doing this and that. And, you know, at the core, it just made me realize like how much I enjoy just a small team Mm -hmm. working uh, on a couch in my living room, like just so simple. And that's when I'm the happiest and without stress. It's just, just doing things small. And I think that's where I've found the most enjoyment. That's at the heart of every YouTuber, right? That's how we started. And there's pressure always on YouTube to continue growing because within the algorithm, if you're not growing, you're stagnating. Yeah. And if you're stagnating, someone's outperforming you and it hurts. So there's always pressure to grow, but then you don't want to grow too big where you lose control and you give up control and stop enjoying the things you once enjoyed. So it's a very tricky sort of business to maintain, but you, you, you're almost painting it in a negative light that you tried something that someone else recommended or something that wasn't exactly what you wanted. But isn't it just a form of experimentation where you needed to step outside you know, your own yeah, gut? Potentially. I th- Part of me thinks I could have done that for a lot less. <laughs> okay. But because I look at the value of that, I'm like, yeah. you know, I could learn that for 50K. Mm-hmm. But you know what? It is what it is. And at the end of the day, I mean, well, what can I, we have to yeah. balance that because, yeah. you know, you talked about two bad losses. What are you, what's your biggest win? There's been a lot of them. I mean, are we talking, oh, okay. are we talking about like, in, are okay. we talking about like investments or yeah. are we talking about, yeah, like just anything? Deals, investments. Oh, man. Um, well, one of them, well, basically any anything real estate related that I've done has done extremely well. All of those have been fantastic. Two, two really stand out. One, um, one is a duplex I bought, uh, five hundred eighty-five thousand dollars, and and it needed a lot of work. But this was a listing; it it, it was worth six fifty when I saw it, mm-hmm. and the agent didn't know what they had. They just the guy was from out of town, had no. I just put it up at this price. It was the first one to see it made an offer that same night and I told them they have to accept it at asking. 
mm. um, or maybe slightly lower, but I got him to accept it that night. And it was instantly worth like 75 grand more than I was paying, like instantly. And I fixed it up. And as I was fixing it up, I'm like, I could move in this one side. And like, I started doing the math on this. And like, if I rent this out, uh, I, I could build the garage out of the studio and use that as tax writer with the equity. It worked out to be a free place to stay. So fixed it up. I uh, started working out of the garage. It was a one bedroom duplex, maybe like 700 square feet. I loved this place. Okay. And it was free. And it was like the $0 duplex because I got it reappraised and I pulled out, I did a cash out refinance from all the money I put in it out. Mm-hmm. And it's still, uh, well, at that point it broke even. Mm-hmm. But it was basically a free place to stay that I had no, none of my own money in. And I got to live there. And that was like the coolest thing ever, just thinking like, it, I, I got I get to live in Los Angeles in a place that I love with like a garage and that's my studio and like it's free, so I love that. Okay. Um, then the other place was um, I guess the the home I'm living in in Vegas. I mean that was just, that was luck. Okay. But it was like not the worst of COVID, but like really when that first went down, I put I think it was like fifteen or twelve percent down on the home. Uh, and then since I had my license at the time, I was able to reroute the commission against the down payment. And so I was in this thing, maybe like 10% down on a 30 year mortgage at 2.8%, mm-hmm. uh, right before Vegas just took off. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think the, the home went from like one and a half, uh, to maybe 2.8 wow. at the peak. Now it's probably down to two, 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 three with the market going down, mm-hmm. but like it does I'm not going to sell it, sure. but but just putting such little money down, like when you consider like maybe it was a hundred grand, like total out of pocket mm-hmm. to go from a hundred grand to what was that over a million dollars in equity in two years. I mean, that's not normal by any yeah. means. And that was a lot of luck, but a lot of good it's just, th- that was crazy to think mm-hmm. that you could, you know, 12 extra money like that. Do you, have you made more money with your investments or on social media? Social media by far. Really? But, oh Yeah. But, but the thing is, it's like, I'm not working on my investments. I think a lot of people have this conception like, oh yeah, he makes most of his money from YouTube. But yeah, I mean, that's how it works though. Yeah. Because it's like, I spend 12 hours a day on YouTube Mm -hmm. trying to do, like trying to build the business of that six, seven days a week. And my investments, I spend nothing. I mean, maybe an hour to a month. Mm -hmm. Um, This year might be the first year, maybe give or take where my investments match what I could do on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it, I'm just trying to funnel. Like everything I make from YouTube just gets funneled into investments. Um, it. And it's a, just a 50-50 real estate index funds. How do you know what to invest in? I mean, outside of index funds uh, without spending the time to do your due diligence or research? Because you're saying you're not spending much time on it. Very little. Um, I, I do do research, but I just, I believe in the market long term. Mm. And I basically go off the study that over 20 to 30 years, the stock market's going to have a positive return. And I care about wealth pres- preservation and just having some sort of growth. Mm-hmm. And so I've seen historically a three fund portfolio or investing in US equities or a total stock market index along with international index that should yield a return of anywhere from like five to 7% long term mm-hmm. for 20 years. So I just yeah. think I'm locking up my money for 20 years. Whatever I put in here, I'm not going to touch until I'm 50. And if it makes Five percent, four percent. I'd be happy with that. Mm-hmm. The real estate aspect is something I want to get more involved in, and I haven't because I focus so much on YouTube mm-hmm. that it, real estate takes a lot of work, and you have to be on there every single day, looking at properties, making offers. It's it, it's very much an active income in the beginning, and I thought, well, my time is best spent on YouTube right now, but mm-hmm. uh, I want to get back into real estate. So for me, commercial real estate is my next investment, so I'm mm-hmm. looking for it. But I think. My my thought is that the market has a little bit more room to go down for commercial, mm-hmm. and a lot of sellers haven't fully priced in the interest rate hikes. So I'm waiting for that to happen or when I could get a good enough deal. What advice do you give for people who would consider investing in real estate or, or the market? Yeah. Like general. I think it helps to buy a place for yourself to live in first because you have total control over that. Mm-hmm. As long as you're planning to live there for like seven to 10 years or, or live in the location or, or own the property. I would say the biggest risk is that you buy a property with the expectation of selling it in a few years and making money. It probably won't happen. Realistically, you should be holding for seven to 10 years. I think if you know you're going to live in a location or you don't mind renting it out and being a landlord, to buy something for yourself, preferably rent out the bedrooms or get like a duplex, triplex, fourplex, live in one of the units and rent out the others. 
Uh, easier said than done in some locations. Like Las Vegas, we don't really have a lot of duplexes, but mm -hmm. you could get a great house, rent out the bedrooms, a five bedroom house, 350, 400 grand. Rent out the bedrooms for $1,000 each. Get really good people in there. Get your friends in there. And if you do it right, you'll have a free place to stay. The average person, I think, spends like 25 to 33% of their income goes to housing. Mm -hmm. Now imagine it's like, now you could see it as though you just got a 25 to 33% pay raise. You're making 33% more money because you did that uh, and made that decision. And sure, you live with roommates for a little bit, but I think it's, a, again, a sacrifice that you can make in your 20s. If you have a good credit score, you have stable income. Mm -hmm. And then what about for equities? I take a very passive approach personally mm -hmm. of just index funds. I dabble every now and then with picking individual stocks. Some have done really well and some have done really bad. Uh, but I do that with like under 5% of my portfolio, 90 plus index funds, because I acknowledge I, I cannot time the market. I just buy every day. Mm -hmm. It's like, it, it's a stupid habit of mine where every morning I wake up, I buy just the same index funds and I do it every day. Some people could do every week or every month. It doesn't matter. But for me, it's, it's just like a, a hobby Go in there and I buy my funds every day. It's just, it's fun. And I can have fun within the day trying to time like what time I think it's going to be best. <laughs> sure. It's stupid. It's just a game. Like it makes no difference mm -hmm. long term. But because long term, I, when you're thinking 20 years, what's the difference? Of, what's the difference of yeah. like 12 p.m. to 1 p.m.? And like, but but sometimes I enjoy if I see the market trending, I could guess. Like I get it, get it out of my system in the day. It's like it's going down, down a percent. I'm like, could it go down 1.2? Place a limit order and like see if it hits. Every what, now and then it does. What's the worst financial decision you see us make, like 20, 30-year-olds? I would say not setting up a Roth IRA. Mm -hmm. I think it's just, it's something that a lot of people could be doing that don't, and it's incredibly easy. Yeah. So a Roth IRA is basically an account that you could set. It's a retirement account where you could invest money after tax. So like, let's say you make $1,000 in a, you know, a week or whatever. Um, after taxes, that'll be, Seven hundred dollars, eight hundred, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So you're taking that eight hundred dollars that's left over after tax, and you're investing it in a Roth IRA or an account. And by the time you're sixty five, all that profit you make within the account is tax free. So you're able to invest it in stocks. You could, uh, you know, do index funds. There's a multitude of investments that you could make. But the goal is that when you're young and doing that, you have forty years of compound interest, where all of a sudden that, you know, eight hundred dollars you invest could be worth. You know, eight thousand, five thousand dollars, and it's tax free, and and the limit I believe is sixty five hundred dollars a year. And there are ways to get a, you know more than that, or if you're above the income limit. But for most people, it takes ten minutes to set up an account. It's super easy to do. If you have any questions, call the broker. Vanguard is one of them. Just call them up. TD Ameritrade or, or uh, Fidelity, Charles Schwab, anybody. Just call them on the phone. You can set it up in ten minutes. And you could have a great life when you're 65 plus. Yeah. So without I mean, sacrificing much. It's it's sixty five hundred dollars a year. Mm -hmm. it, it depends. For some re for some people that'll be a ton of money. For others it'll be nothing. But I, I mean, think I think after you factor in compound interest, it's gonna be a good amount be, of money if you're doing it in your oh late yeah. teens, early twenties. Oh yeah, you could you could be a millionaire from this. Just yeah. just doing that. If you just did five hundred dollars a month, and again, to some people it could be a lot or a little, it doesn't have to. It could be a hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. Just something to get you started. My, uh, from what I've seen is that usually once people get started, they get excited about it and they want to do more of it. Mm -hmm. So even if it's $50 a, a month, it doesn't matter. Just as long as you get started and you get to see, once you see it growing, you'll just become addicted to sure. it. Sure. Hopefully. <laughs> What's your take on the, the crypto and alternative asset world of NFTs and such? That's a good, I, I never got into NFTs. I could never understand it. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought crypto punks were something that I could see like maybe one day. Like that, I think it's an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. per, my personal thought for NFTs is that it should be a way to verify ownership or authenticity on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. So my thinking is that a Gucci bag should come attached with an NFT that you could probably scan and be like, okay, this is real. And this is on the official Gucci whatever, some Rolex watches, like, like things like this, or, or maybe a house uh, to verify ownership of that. Like, these are all concepts, but but the idea that someone could generate like a whale image and make four hundred grand for that—that's stupid to me. Okay. Uh, as far as crypto, I believe ninety-five to ninety-eight percent of it's probably a waste, and there's no purpose for it. If there's not a purpose, like a, a lot of them are, I just feel like are only there to make money. Mm -hmm. I think Bitcoin, Ethereum are the two that are interesting to me, um, and I right now I think it makes up about three, 
maybe 4% of my total portfolio is, is a 50-50 mix of Bitcoin and Ethereum. Mm -hmm. I think at the peak, it was maybe like 6 or 7%, give or take. But I figure 3%, I'll take the risk on it. If it goes to zero, fine. It doesn't matter. I'd rather take the 3% risk and be in it than not. And, you know, I, but I could afford to do that. Sure. But yeah, if, if someone has, you know, a grand, it just, it has to be an amount that you're mentally prepared to write off to zero. Sure. Like it has to be that because it very well could. Yeah. That's the biggest fear that I see with, with people that talk to me about is that they get very excited by it yeah. and they're willing to put everything in and they can't risk losing everything. And yet they do. Yeah. Well, I would say the problem is that it's, it's very easy on social media to see people making a ton of money, mm. a ton. And most of uh, it is BS. Would you agree with me on that? No, I think a lot of it's, a lot of it's real, but you have these just outliers, especially because those are the stories that like get the most attention. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have these outliers that uh, make a ton of money doing it. And you think, well, they're doing it. Why, why can't I? Like, there's all these other opportunities. I, this is just normal dude here. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy for people to jump into that and not realize that there are tremendous risks in doing that. The Dogecoin millionaire was, was someone for me. I had him on my channel two to three times. It, it, we did a one hour podcast. And the second half of that podcast was just trying to convince him to sell. This is someone who's making 50 grand a year. And he turned, he, he sold everything he had, maxed out his credit cards and put 150 or 200 grand in Dogecoin, like a fraction of a, you know, yeah. I forget, maybe like a penny or something mm -hmm. like that. And at the peak, it was worth $3 million. Mm -hmm. And this is a dude making 50 grand a year, like the life-changing money after tax. Yeah. And we broke it down. I'm like, dude, you will never have to work a day in your life after tax. Invest it in here. You can pull 3% of it out every single year. That's your salary. You've made your salary for life. If you just sell right now, why take the risk? Mm -hmm. And so, it, well, he didn't sell. But I think people forget that like it, it can go down and, and the losses are real. So anything you do invest, if you have a life-changing amount of money, it's worth it to sell. Uh, if you could write it out to zero, so be it. But it's risky. But I do believe you see the outliers because those are the people that get the most attention. To me, I'll tell you my mindset why I think a lot of it is fake. Yeah, I don't mean it's fake in that they didn't earn what they said they earned or that they had a big sale multiple times over. That's true. Mm -hmm. But it's in the same way I grew up in the poker community in New York where you would frequently hear a, a guy winning huge amounts and then when you become friendly with this person, you'd see how much they're actually losing on most days and that their big win maybe nets out to zero mm. with their losses that you never really hear about people's losses because no one wants to celebrate their losses. And they'll quickly show you how their paper millionaires, like uh, the Dogecoin millionaire yeah. that you had on your show, uh, where look on paper, I'm worth this. But until you sell it, you're not worth anything really especially in the era of Dogecoin, where this is not yeah. anything of real value. It's all speculative value. So I feel like a lot of pe what people see is these paper millionaires or maybe millionaires that lose that made a million on this project but mm. lost 10 million on all these other yeah, projects. Yeah, maybe. And as a result, they're being misled to think, oh, this person only picks winners. That's very true. That's a great point. I don't know. Maybe I'm I wrong. Think, I think it's very prevalent too when GameStop was having yeah. its massive run up and mm -hmm. you saw, you know, deep, deep F in value on Wall Street bets <laughs> posting these $44 million screenshots. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge win. But mm -hmm. I think a lot of people saw that. I'm like, well, if he's doing, if he's in, I'm in. And yeah. there's that mentality that like we're in this together. But really, how many losses came before that Probably one? a lot. A lot, right? Yeah. Especially when you're in this volatile space like the crypto world. I don't know. That, that's I agree. Point. My mindset, just write it off to zero. Yeah. If it's something great, if not, it, it, it should have always been speculative and just a risk to begin with. Fair. So make your prediction right now, 2020, 2030. What is the price of Bitcoin? Oh gosh, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't even tell you. Well, like, here's the thing. I guess. Wouldn't, I wouldn't hypothesize. Well, I don't, because, man, it's like either way. If I say less, it's bad. If I say more, no, then I'm pumping nothing, it. This is a it's, judgment it's either free, way. This is Planet Fitness, judgment-free zone. Well, the comments are going to judge now. It's like, if, if I say, if <laughs> I say we're hi, turning off the comments. If I say hi, everyone's going to say I'm pumping it. If I say low, then I'm fudding. No. I don't think I don't think there's a, a scenario where I could say a number where I could win. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. You know what number you could say where what? you win? Whatever you honestly believe, because then it doesn't matter what the comments say. Oh, gosh. 2030? Uh... Oh man, I don't know. I mean, my honest thought is that I wouldn't be surprised if you told me it was a million dollars. I would not be surprised. Mm -hmm. If you told me that it was banned 
and that they found a way around it and it's now worth a thousand or a hundred dollars, I wouldn't be surprised either. So I would say a range anywhere from a thousand to a million would not shock me with Bitcoin. I've been so surprised with Bitcoin. I saw it hit a thousand dollars. I thought it was the stupidest thing in the world. I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe one day, and you could watch the video that I had back in, uh, I think 20, early 2017, I made a video when it first hit a thousand bucks. And I said, maybe at one point it could be used as a store of wealth. I think as, as a use of currency, it makes no sense at all. Could it be used to store wealth? Probably, maybe. Um, but I thought it was silly. I, I didn't, tr I mean, the more I looked into it, the more I'm like, I, I could see its utility. I could see its purpose and why people are attracted to it. So I could go either. Man, okay. I can't. So I can't you're not, yeah. not going to give me an answer. I can't give you Fine. an answer on can't, that. Can't clip it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you live in Vegas. I do. And you told me earlier that you had a scare with skin cancer. Yeah. Vegas is a dangerous place for those who have had skin cancer scares. Tell mm -hmm. me about that. Yeah. So this was actually, the scare came in California when I was there. And uh, I would usually go out and just like lay in the sun for like 15, 20 minutes. Mm hmm try to get a bit of a tan because I work inside. So like okay. this is my outside sort of, you know, skin. Sunlight exposure. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, over time, I started getting these moles. Mm -hmm. And there were quite a few of them and they started growing bigger. And when I was in, well, I just moved to Vegas and one of them started itching. Mm. And I wasn't sure if it was just like the dryness or if it was bad. So then of course I go online. And when I go online, I convince myself I had uh, basal cell. Mm -hmm. and everything I'm looking up, I'm looking at the pictures, I'm like, this matches perfectly, uh, this is this, and I think it was my grandfather had it, and so it runs in the family, and I was like, this is it. And so I went to a doctor, and I was all freaked out about it, mm -hmm. and within, I don't know, a minute, she's like, oh, you have atypical mole syndrome, and it's something to watch uh, out for. We'll, we'll take, like, you know... Uh, uh, Some biopsies. Uh, uh, no, they didn't Shapes. take it. No, they didn't do oh. anything. She said, we'll just, we'll keep an eye on them. We'll, we'll basically watch where they are now, but come back to us every year and wear sunscreen. Mm -hmm. And so I've done that. Um, part of me in the back of my mind was like, maybe I should have got a second opinion. <laughs> but I look up atypical mole syndrome and um, like it matches basically my moles exactly. Mm -hmm. But it's something in the back of my mind. But I, now I stay out of the sun or if I am and I'll put sunscreen. Sure. That's wise. Um, the, the thing with, Atypical moles is, for me, I like to investigate them and make sure they're good. Obviously, during doing a dermoscopy, uh, they, they put some kind of magnifying glass yes. or any kind of... Okay, so they yeah, did, she that. did. That, that's a That's a, a good place to start. Because there you could see certain things that you can't see with the naked eye because yeah. you get to see a little layer below. Um, but I'm glad that you were diagnosed with a non-cancerous condition. Yeah, that's me positive. too. positive. And yeah. you got a good uh, active takeaway from it to wear sunscreen. Yeah, exactly. And I was never a sunscreen proponent until mm -hmm. like after that. And now I'm just better safe than sorry. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, are there any other ways being a, a world-class investor that you invest in your own health? Uh, I would say, you know what? I kept up the boxing trainer. Really? Yeah, I still do that once a week. Okay. And... It's something that forces me in to go to the gym and keep it up and not lose that skill. And now I'm going to the gym like five, six days a week. I have okay. a log where now I feel guilty if I don't go. Like now I try to make like Gamify where if I can mm -hmm. go every day, it's like even better. Okay. Uh, and cardio is something. I hated cardio. Mm -hmm. Boxing got me into cardio. Mm -hmm. and what so kind now, of cardio? Uh, either a, a walk on a steep incline. Like I do the 13 incline on the treadmill yep. uh, with like the 3.2 speed. Speed. Yeah. speed. Uh, for 30 minutes. Okay. Gets That's me really good. good. Or running, which I hated running before. Wow. I couldn't okay. stand it, but I got running shoes. I, the problem was that I was running without running shoes. Okay. I'd wear vesties, thinking <laughs> okay. like, I didn't know. You're like, but then I got waterproof. Ru yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then I got running shoes. I'm like, oh man, this is so much easier. Like I was doing it wrong What the running time. shoes did you decide on? I don't know. Oh. I just okay. went to the running shoe store and they fitted it and I was off to the races. You were sold, okay. Yeah. Um, and then do you do anything unique for your health? Do you take any kind of medicinal herbs, supplements. Maybe I should. Board stuff. No, no, no. I don't. Absolutely I not. don't. Oh, no. you know what? I've been trying to get better about drinking water. Okay. That's something I've been terrible about. Like mm -hmm. I'll go all day just drinking coffee and then I get to dinner. I'm like, I didn't have oh, any that, water today. Well, when you're drinking coffee, you're drinking water. But probably not as much as I should. Like, Well, each cup of coffee is mostly water. I heard it's a, a diuretic, right? So it's like... So caffeine is a diuretic. Yeah. Um, and... 
consuming coffee kind of negates the effect of the diuretic. Okay. Because the diuretic makes you create urine, but you create urine from the water that's within the coffee. Okay. So it's not a dehydrating thing per se, because it's a net neutral. Um, But if you're having espresso shots, that can be dehydrated. I am not. Because then you're having caffeine without all the liquid. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, you know, it's funny. I did a sponsorship with this company, Copilot, mm-hmm. and it's like this personal uh, trainer that they get you on. I work the with app. them too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I like them. Yeah. My guy was like probably the same guy. Mm-hmm. I'd imagine was like, dude, you got to drink more water. <laughs> okay. And so he set me up on this thing where it's like I'm supposed to drink five water bottles a day and mm-hmm. then track them off on the app. And I'm okay. uh, as I started doing it, I've not been perfect about it, but as I started doing it, it's like this is how much water I should be drinking. Like, it's a lot. Like, mm-hmm. I'm constantly... Well, if bathroom. you're working out, you need more water, so absolutely. But, or if, I'm just, or if I'm just sitting, though, like, because I'm I'm sitting most of the day and I'm working out at night. Yeah, and but so when like, you're working out, I'm assuming you're sweating. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. That's probably... Remember, you also get water from fruits, vegetables, foods, not I just... I be better about water, eating yeah. fruits and vegetables, too. Yeah. yeah. Well, My that's diet's why not I'm, the best. I mean, it's it's healthy, but it's like Greek yogurt... That's like amazing. A salad, what but you, like, but no is, fruits and like. What's a salad? That is a vegetable. Well, I guess so. But like, I'm thinking like fruits and okay. Well, like fruits are important. Stuff, yeah, for sure. But um, there's a lot of misinformation that exists in the world of being healthy, health and wellness. Has any of that come across your radar where you were curious about it or you had questions about it? Whether it's fitness related or, uh, I would say probably two things. One, uh, the amount of sushi I eat. Okay. I don't know if that's good. Or <laughs> How bad. much sushi do you eat? Probably twice a week. Oh, that's not much, is it? No? Yeah. But but they're they're all you can eat places. Like Vegas is all you can eat sushi. <laughs> I so love it's like that a lot. You're trying to maximize <laughs> bang for your buck. Thirty dollars all you could eat sushi neko in Las Vegas. Okay, they're, I don't know. They're so bucks, popular all now. You can eat sushi. I'm really nervous. What kind of quality fish you're getting? It's amazing. Really? Yeah. It's funny. I talk about them all the time, okay. and almost every time I go to sushi neko, there's like a subscriber there or like really? multiple subscribers that are there and they always say dude we came in vegas we, we heard you talking about sushi neko and we're here wow it's funny okay so you got to be careful with your mercury yeah and then I probably mean, red wh- meat which yeah. fish huh? do you consume the most probably salmon oh well that's like a healthier fish okay because the fish you want to avoid is like swordfish the bigger fish basically okay. are the ones that have higher rates of mercury okay basically those bigger fish that eat smaller fish that then concentrate the mercury for sure um and then you said you eat a lot of red meat red meat Mm-hmm. Steaks. Like a lot of steaks or probably again, probably twice a week, if that. Yeah, I mean it's not not the end of the world. Uh there's potential for it to increase some yeah. conditions. But when we're talking about increasing conditions, even when we say, you know, eating processed meats, hot dogs and all these things that are generally considered unhealthy, mm. they can increase your risk of colon cancer by X percent. Remember, that percent that we're talking about is off of the baseline lifetime risk. Mm. So if your lifetime risk of developing colon cancer is say 1%, the average person, and then your risk goes up by 20%, that goes up to 1.2. 20% sounds scary, but one to 1.2 doesn't sound that bad, right? Yeah. So we have to always talk about the differences between absolute and relative risk when we're talking about That's interesting. risk adjustment. Yeah. Because a lot of news articles will try and scare people. It's difficult. There, there was something I... I, I read online about like increasing the risk of cancer by like, it was one of those statistics by like 50%. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, you know, it was actually on Reddit and people were disproving that in the medical subreddit of like, yeah, but dude, it's so low. It's like one out of every 10,000 people. So now it's like two out of every 15. It's like something silly like that. Well, that's why I hate those studies that are like, if you eat almonds, it'll extend your life by 20 years because they like extrapolated the figure oh, that was no. found. And that's not real. And why I hate all those studies as a primary care doctor is when I have a patient in front of me, there's so many risks in their life that decide whether or not they stay healthy. That worrying about that little risk is probably not worth the benefit of challenging them to overcome that risk. Yeah, There's other wins to be had that have way bigger returns. Yeah, but the problem right now is that that sort of stuff is going viral on TikTok. Yeah. Is it like you watch one of them yes. and then all of a sudden it feeds you yes. more and more and more and you go down that rabbit hole. Which is why my number one series is debunking TikToks. Is it <laughs> really? Yeah, right now. It's fantastic. It, and it means it. Yeah, it's terrible. Do you find um, that you have a good relationship with your primary care doctor or do you even have a primary care doctor? I do. And I, sh- God, I, I just, I don't go to the doctor unless I bad. Like I ever? Get, like yearly, I go to the even? doctor. <sighs> I, di- I did recently. Okay. So just because it was so long, I only go if I have a problem. It's That's bad. bad. We got to change that. I know. 
So I went and we did the general checkup. The only thing that came back, they did full blood work. The only thing that came back was sl slightly above average LDL cholesterol. Oh, okay. Good to talk about. Don't know why. Uh, I can I was, tell you why. Probably the why. Meat. You think red meat? Yeah. Okay. Well. I, I have the same issue. Okay. My LDL is elevated. I did like a whole YouTube video about Interesting. it. Interesting. But um, again, you have to factor that in to a whole picture. Uh, a patient is not their, just one number. All right. Yeah. So you have to factor in a lot of variables before you even make decisions on where to go from there. Whether it's just lifestyle changes and a few dietary changes that you could make that can easily lower that number where we could decrease the amount of saturated fat you consume, increase the amount of fiber you consume, yeah. and that number will go away. Versus some doctors are very quick to start with the medicines. Yeah. And you, we don't always need to do that, but there's sometimes real tangible life-saving benefits to doing so. Yeah. And that's what a good primary care doctor should be able to yeah. guide you on. So yeah, I did I did that checkup, but only because it's been so long. Mm -hmm. I, honestly, I just, I just only go if there's a problem, which I know is bad. But do you know why? Like uh, you say it's yeah. bad. Why, yeah. why is it bad? Because there could be something that's maybe just, I don't, I don't know. Well, you that's know, why I'm this, curious. This when you dormant. say it's bad, I'm, yeah. I want to know what is in your head. It's that, probably probably there. There could be something laying dormant that I wouldn't know about until a professional sees it. It's like hard. What? It's I don't know. Like it could be anything. Like I don't know. Well, like give like, me an example because I'm always curious yeah. why people think they should go for an annual physical. Because I have a theory. Yeah. Okay. I believe that most people don't believe in an annual physical. Yeah. They just treat the annual physical as a way to oh, here's my list of problems that I'm going to bring into my annual physical. <laughs> Whereas what the annual physical yeah. should be, let's talk about preventing problems. Sure. And instead it turns into, here's the list of the things that have been bothering yeah. me for the longest time. Okay, well, present. I'll give you an example. You're right. Okay. Uh, I ended up making the appointment because every now and then I have these weird dizzy spells. Okay. Could last anywhere from like 10 seconds to 15 seconds goes away. Okay. Uh, and there was a period there for like a month where it was like every few days and I was trying to pinpoint it, like when it would start. Am I laying down? Did I eat that day? Was mm -hmm. I drinking water? Did I get a good night's sleep? And I couldn't pinpoint anything. And there okay. was one day, middle of the afternoon, so I like I'd eaten, was awake, got a good night's sleep, where it wouldn't go away for like two minutes. And like, it was just a weird thing where like the room would spin, I blink, and then it like resets, room would spin, blink. Uh, and usually it goes away, but it didn't go away for a few minutes. So I was like, all right, I gotta go to the doctor and see what it is. Couldn't pinpoint anything, and as soon as I went, it disappeared. <laughs> like, I have not had it since then, which okay. was months ago. Okay. So, I don't know. It fixed but itself. It fixed itself, but that was the reason. That was what prompted me to go. I was like, all right, right just in case. Well, see, that I'm glad you went, yeah. because a lot of people will postpone going and wait for the thing to become bigger, maybe more serious, yeah. or maybe just build up anxiety around it and create other negative problems from the anxiety around it. But the reason that I recommend people to go yearly for a preventive visit is a few reasons. One, there are specific tests that we do that have an impact on your lifespan and quality of life, like cancer screenings, like vaccinations. These are things that we do to actively catch things early. And we cannot catch all things early. Any doctor that starts ordering every test under the book willy-nilly is doing you a disservice. There's things that we know we can catch early and act upon. And mm -hmm. then there's things that we can catch and have no utility, or maybe the test is not made for that. And as a result, we're gonna get mixed signals from it. So it creates a very murky picture. So preventing all problems is impossible, but there are certain things that we can catch early and be pro proactive on. And then also there's lifestyle things that happen to us, like the foods we eat, the exercise habits we have, the mental health that we're experiencing, um, and even something as simple as social connections that during a doctor's visit should be elucidated. Because I'll have, you know, a 25-year-old female come in, female patient, and I'll ask them if they feel safe at home, and we find out they're in a domestic uh, abuse situation or intimate partner violence, that would have never come out unless they went to a mm. primary care doctor's office. And here we can create some strategies on how to mitigate or maybe get out of that relationship or create safety mechanisms. And that's one example. Then you have like sex, health, that's another example. And there's a lot of these things that a good primary care doctor can talk to you about to prevent problems from becoming worse. So it's not miraculous. Sure. We can't catch everything early. There's okay. no like miracle see-through magnifying glass that we have, but there are certain things that will create tangible benefits. What should I be looking for at 32, 33? Uh, a 30, I, I won't do it to you because I'm not your doctor, but I'll say a 32-year-old male should be looking out for 
prevention of early onset cardiac disease by living a, a healthy lifestyle, making the necessary lifestyle changes, making sure that their sugars are in good shape, making sure that their cholesterol is in good shape, because that will set you up for success as you get older to mm -hmm. lower your risk of heart disease. That's our biggest killer in the world. Uh, well, mostly in the United States, but worldwide it's a big issue as well. Um, risks for sexual health, making sure that you're as safe as possible there. Um, do you have any family history of anything? Or does this hypothetical uh, patient have? <laughs> yeah, yeah, hypothetically, uh, I would say Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, skin cancer. I think that's it. Yeah, so skin checks are going to be valid, especially given uh, the location of where you live. Um, and then also behavior with alcohol mm -hmm. and other mind-altering substances. I don't just mean drugs. I mean even caffeine as well like the timing of when you're consuming the beverages, how they impact your sleep, your rest, because the idea is to get you as healthy as possible to the older age yeah. right now. So alcohol, caffeine, sexual health, making sure your heart's in good health, and then mental health. Got Those it. are the biggest things for Let's you. Let's talk right? about caffeine. I'll yeah. usually have, I, I think I'm pretty responsible for it, usually two cups a day. That's a great coffee. amount of caffeine. Usually never after 7 p.m. Oh, that's tight. But never after. But that's but tight. Like, it might be like 6.37. That's tight. Yeah, if I yeah. go to bed at like midnight? Yeah, that's tight. Really? Well, you probably, as someone who's been drinking two cups for a while, I presume, yeah. probably won't feel the effect, but it's t definitely having an effect yeah. on, on the quality of sleep, feeling refreshed in the morning. Y you would get a bigger benefit just pushing a little earlier. Really? Yeah. Now, what about going to the gym right before going to the bed? Because usually I'll drink bit of a coffee before going to the gym. Mm -hmm. So if I drink a coffee at six, I'm going to the gym at like seven, seven thirty. I don't mind that. Yeah. I think that's very individual dependent. I've had patients that they work out at night, they fall asleep like a baby. Mm -hmm. And then there's patients who can't because they have an adrenaline rush, they can't fall asleep. I'll tell you what it's like for me personally. I, if I have a low to moderate intensity workout, uh, I can sleep great even if I worked out at 10 PM. Mm -hmm. But now if I'm doing sprints or something for like boxing training, no shot, I'm going to sleep well for the next three hours. Okay. So it depends on what you're doing, what stage of life you're in. But if it works for you, the, the, the extra is not the end of the world. Okay, cool. Yeah. So yeah, caffeine is, um, it, it's one of those things in medicine where if we look back each decade, we've had differing recommendations. Oh, it, it will cause cancer. It will prevent cancer. It will extend your life. It'll shorten your life. I it's choose to mess. believe it'll extend your life. Well, I think <laughs> the reality two cups probably won't have the impact that you think it will. Yeah. So again, it falls into that category for me, not worth worrying about. Yeah. I see some of these things though that now have like 300 milligrams of caffeine or this pre-workouts that you see. Oh yeah. I don't get those. But, do, yeah. do you know how much caffeine is in a large or whatever they call large in Starbucks, grande blonde roast? A blonde roast. My guess is probably 75 to 85 milligrams of caffeine. 400 plus. What? Mm -hmm. A blonde? Wait, wait, explain this. Yeah, I, don't, I can't. <laughs> how how is that is that specific? Because a cup of coffee is like sixty five to ninety five, right? For a cup of coffee, I mean, it depends how strong the coffee. But yeah, I would say eighty to one hundred is my range. Okay, what about for a str is the stronger the coffee, the more the caffeine? Well, when you just... say stronger, are you talking about bitterness or darkness of roast? Darkness, darkness lower the caffeine. Okay, yeah. But what about the thick coffee, like the like the you know, it's like like a mud. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about the muddy coffee. Okay. But the, the light roast, that's why the blonde roast yeah. is the highest amount. Wow. And it's 400. I and didn't know it's that much. And there's people who throw uh, espresso shots in there as well. I didn't know it's that much. And 400 is the cap that we recommend medically to have in a day. And people are having that in one drink. What do you think the long-term effect is on the caffeine use today? I think it's... So the the bot the human body works on two nervous systems. One is the rest and digest, chill nervous system and repair, mm -hmm. and then the other one is the fight or flight. We call them the parasympathetic. That's the rest of the digest, and then the sympathetic is the fight or flight activates when you see a lion. In our current society, I think we're all sleep deprived, so we're ready. We're living in that fight or flight mode to keep us awake. Because if not, we'll be falling asleep in our chairs mm -hmm. at work. And then in order to make it easier for us to do that, we're chugging a ton of caffeine to keep us awake. And as a result, again, staying in this fight or flight state and never having the rest, repair, digest. So it feels like we're breaking our bodies down by being over caffeinated. And I think we're going to find a link. This is 
speculative, a link between early dementia, Alzheimer's from the lack of sleep and over-caffeination of our society. Something to watch out for. Yeah. Because I, I don't think caffeine is bad necessarily on its own for your brain, but I think if you're not sleeping and you're substituting a ton of caffeine for it, that's when it becomes bad for your brain. Okay. So. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. So easy. All right, all right, <laughs> really right, I'll stick with my two cups. <laughs> yeah. And two like cups six. is great. I thought yeah. you were going to tell me a wild figure. I've had patients no. tell me. Crazy amounts. No, crazy, crazy no, no. Amounts. I probably at the peak, it maybe was like three or four, but I'd always mm -hmm. keep it like reasonable. I, I've always been paranoid that I'd like build up too much of a tolerance to it. Mm -hmm. So I try purposely not to. That's smart. Yeah. Did you drink caffeine before your boxing match? I did. Did it make you more nervous? Probably the same. So. I, I was the same nervous for the last like two okay. weeks. I didn't get more or less nervous. <laughs> okay. It was the same thing. Got it. Okay. But yeah, I downed a coffee before and... Uh, Listen, it didn't help. And no difference. I mean, I was so wired. Already, I, yeah. I, my body wouldn't have been able to tell. I mean, okay. if anything, it made it harder because I like me thinking I had to go pee probably made me think that I had to go pee more because I was just paranoid. Yeah. Like, what if I pee and all the gloves are on? Like, what would happen? <laughs> you know, that's a reasonable concern. Yeah. Though. All right. We're going to go into the lightning round. Cool. You ready? I'm ready. What's the one hypothetical medical product you wish you could invest in? doesn't have to exist now. Create it right now. Oh, gosh. Probably male birth control. Okay. That's being developed right yeah. now. In shot form, pill form. Interesting. Sticker form. All right. Um, what's one thing your body does that not everybody else's body does? I think my body does everything, man. <laughs> uh, it does. It, I, I, Is your body unique? Does it do any unique functions? I don't think, it, I don't think it's unique. It, it takes punch as well. It takes punch as well. <laughs> I'll go well, with that. Well, sure. you, you were able to stand it yeah. up to that. Um, what's one thing you could do if you couldn't get hurt? Fly. I don't know. Um, one thing I could do if I couldn't get hurt. Um, I'm terrified of heights. So I would say maybe bungee jumping okay. or uh, skydiving. Fair. Have you ever been seriously injured? Never been seriously injured. The worst was uh, I was on a fence as a kid, third, second grade, and uh, a buddy of mine pushed me off the fence as like a fun little joke, and I hit my head right Ooh. here on the corner of the uh, the planter, and it was stone, and I hit my head open. I had to get like 12 stitches. Wow. Okay, well, that puts us into the next question. What's the most physically painful thing that's ever happened to you? Was it that? Uh, physically painful, probably, probably... Yeah, I would say I would say that, but again, I was a kid, so I don't. Okay, so your shots fired at Michael Reeves, not hitting you hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your guilty pleasure that you spend too much money on? Uh, it would be my reef aquarium, three hundred and ten gallons, right when you walk in the front door, wow. and it is yeah, there's no expense spared on that tank. How Anything. much does three hundred ten gallon aquarium cost? Uh, it was fifty thousand dollars for the install, and then I probably spent another fifteen thousand dollars on like random stuff. I added up the costs uh, recently. I was just adding up all my expenses, and I think I spent nine grand on stuff wow. this last year. But a lot of that's fish and coral. Like a lot of that's discretionary. So if I see like a cool fish, coral, like upgrade, I'm all about. I love <laughs> coral it. Coral upgrade. Okay. Yeah. You hear that, kids? Save in your twenties, <laughs> buy fish in your thirties. <laughs> the rare fish market is booming right now. <laughs> really? No. It's, Do you it's, trade it's, fish? It's a it's a meme. Oh, okay. It's like the rare fish market. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> Do you have a personal health hack or tip that you love? Uh, someone told me a while ago, the hardest part of going to the gym is just like getting there. And so when I don't feel like going, it's just as simple as putting on your shoes and walking down there and just thinking if I could just do five minutes. But when you do the five minutes, you'll do the full thing. Oh, wow, that's you and Barbara Corcoran gave the same tip. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. great minds. Um, and then last but not least, have you given away Liver King's chain yet? No. I don't know. I've I've yet to wear it because I feel like <laughs> it's not me. It's so like flashy. Yeah. Part of me thinks maybe I should wear it and mm -hmm. like try to get that abundance mind mindset. <laughs> I got. I I feel like I'll know when it's the right time. Okay. I don't know. Do you have any suggestions on that? I don't. But does he make claims about the chain? He said it was given to him by. Kyle. So the story behind the chain was that Steve will do it. Gave it to Kyle as a gift for helping him grow his channel and his mm -hmm. brand. 
Kyle gave it to Liver King on his podcast. Liver King gave it to me. Um, Liver King told me it was supposed to be to show me abundance and to believe that uh, you know anything is possible and you could do it. And uh, does that advice carry less weight given the nature of what we've learned about? Oh King? gosh, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Certainly to some degree, but you know what I think, I think at the end of the day, I think the intention still remains just as powerful as when he gave it to me. Okay. And I don't think that discounts the generosity Fair. of that gift. And I think just the story and the chain, literally, figuratively, uh, the chain of like, you know, giving, custody, yeah. you know, through multiple people, I would love to hand it off to somebody else. Okay. I, I'm hoping just the time presents itself. Ideally, I would love to. If, if, I want it to be like really meaningful to whoever receives it, and to okay. like really make a difference for them. So, okay, whenever that happens, that's going to be a that. good good story when you. Do. But I can't wear it. It's just like first of all, I'm too paranoid about having something that valuable just like on my neck. But then also, it's, it feels like too like blingy, like yeah, too crazy. flashy. Well, it's Liver King. <laughs> and then I have a question from yeah. Sam. You're a successful real estate agent. Pretend I'm a virus. Sell me on moving into your body. Wow. <laughs> well, okay. It's going to be cozy. <laughs> a little cozy in here, but you know what? Uh, great. Uh, well, I don't get a lot of sunlight either. I was about to say a lot of, you get a lot of natural sunlight. You don't get any sun. If you like shade, you like cozy. Uh, but you know what? It's not a fixer upper and uh, it, a prime location. We'll put it that way. Okay. So uh, move in ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What a great conversation with Graham Stefan. Uh, learned a lot about finances. Hope you did too. Click here to learn about TikTok scams because these are legit. Never buy these. Never put your money into them. And as always, stay happy and healthy.